One of the most fascinating stories ever told among engineers is about a transaction between Henry Ford and Charles Steinmetz. Steinmetz uh, was a brilliant engineer born in Germany and escaped to the United States in 1888. General Electric discovered his talent and recruited him. He was only four feet tall due to his deformity, but people called him the little giant because of his outstanding inventions and scientific contributions to electrical engineering. He could listen to the sound of a complex machine and pinpoint the malfunctioning part. The story goes like this. Henry Ford's automobile manufacturing plant in Devon, Michigan had a problem with its gigantic generator, but its engineers couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. Henry Ford reached out to Charles Steinmetz at GE for help. Steinmetz came and asked for a notepad, a pen, and a cot to sleep on. He listened to the generator for two days and night and scribbled computations notes on his notepad. On the second night, he asked for a letter, climbed up, make a chalk mark, and left a note asking the engineers to open the plate at the mark and replace the 16 windings from the field coil. They did, and the generator performed to perfection. Henry Ford was thrilled because the factory could resume production and stop losing money. However, he was stunned when he received an invoice from GE for $10,000. You know, $10,000 in the early 1900s is a significant amount of money. I checked it out and found it could equal to as much as $500,000 today. How could a simple chalk mark on the machine cost so much money? Ford admires Diamond's talent, but balked at the figure. So he asked for an itemized bill. Steinmetz then itemized the bill as the following. Making chalk mark on generator, $1. Knowing where to make the mark, $9,999. Ford looked at it and paid the bill. End of the story. Even though $10,000 was significant, it's nothing compared to the loss each day the factory was not running. I'm thinking, would it be nice if someone could put a chalk mark in this broken world and show us exactly one thing we need to fix to restore a harmonious world? How about our own life? Would it be nice if someone could put a chalk mark on our life to show us one simple change we can make to make our life run smoothly? The good news is that Jesus has put a chalk mark on our lives and shown us one thing we must change to find inner peace and joy living in this fallen world. It's a very simple change, but it may not be easy. Simple doesn't always mean easy, but it's always good to know that we don't have to make a complicated effort to attain and maintain peace and joy. Today, we'll explore Jesus' teaching of the top number one secret to inner peace and joy based on this week's scripture lesson and discover how to live in heaven on earth. Let's begin. Hi, in case we haven't met yet, I'm Sam Stone, the light keeper. You are the light of the world and I am the keeper. No pun intended. It's my calling to help you shine your brightest so that God is glorified in you, and you are satisfied in God. The scripture lesson for today is from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. Listen to the word of the Lord. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, 
Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. Blessed are those who delight in God's word. Thanks be to God. With this parable, Jesus wants us to know what the kingdom of heaven is like so that we can check if we can fit in. Otherwise, you might go to heaven, but you won't enjoy it there. According to C.S. Lewis, hell is where some people freely choose to go because they find heaven doesn't serve their interest. In hell, they can enjoy competition, ego trip, and self-importance. In hell, people are rewarded according to their merit. For the self-serving, heaven is unfair, unjust, and unsavory. Jesus warns us ahead of time to let us know that the kingdom of heaven could be upside down from human expectation. The last will be first, and the first will be last. Surprised? This parable is called the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. The vineyard represents heaven, the owner represents God, and the laborers are us. It's one of many parables Jesus told to describe what the kingdom of heaven is like. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Matthew 21. Based on this and other kingdom parables, Jesus reveals that the key to the kingdom is grace. The kingdom of heaven runs on grace, not justice. Does this surprise you? Many people wait for the kingdom to come so that justice will be done. They want God to send their enemies to burn in hell at the final judgment, thinking that's a day of vengeance. And they want God to reward them according to their merit. To their disappointment, the kingdom does not run on merit, but grace. Remember, the key to the kingdom is grace. Let's look at the context of this passage to understand why Jesus told them this parable. It begins with a rich young ruler came to ask Jesus how he could enter the kingdom. Jesus told him to practice the Ten Commandments for the start. He said, I've already done that. What am I still lacking? And the Bible says Jesus loved him and said, You need one more thing to do. Sell your possessions, give way to the poor, and follow me. The young man went away grieving because he had many possessions. In other words, he had too much to lose. After he left, Jesus said to the disciples, Truly, I tell you, it would be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Matthew 19, 23 to 24. Remember, Jesus was cracking a joke using a form of Hebrew humor, exaggerating the difficulty by comparing a camel going through the eye of a needle. I'm sure right then the disciples were laughing their heads off at Jesus' incredibly creative figure of speech. Then they asked, if a wealthy, intelligent, and successful man like that 
cannot enter heaven. Who can? But Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. What does it mean? It implies this young man will enter the kingdom, not because of his wealth, education, or merit, as most people think, but because of God's grace. God's grace makes the impossible possible. Then Peter seemed jealous when he realized that this young man would enter the kingdom of heaven through grace without following Jesus' instruction to sell his possessions and follow him. Then Peter said in reply, Look, we have left everything and follow you. What then will we have? Matthew 19, 27. We know Peter had a big mouth. He talked his mind. But there's a tone of grievance. If someone like that young man who sacrificed nothing would get to heaven for free, what do I get? I deserve more, or it would be unfair, unjust, and unsavory. He sounded like the big brother of the prodigal son. And Jesus said, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Matthew 19, 29 to 30. Jesus assured them that none of them had sacrificed in vain. But they must know the kingdom of heaven does not practice the first-come, first-served policy. They will be generously rewarded, but not because of their merit. Because the key to the kingdom is grace. Grace means every believer will receive the blessings, but not according to their seniority, intelligence, or merit as Peter's question implied. In order to help them understand this truth, Jesus told them the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. The landowner hires some people to work in his vineyard in the morning, offering them the usual daily wage, which is one denarius. These early workers represent Peter and the 12 disciples. Then he went out several times during the day to hire more people to come in at different times. At about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he asked them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go in to the vineyard, Matthew 26 to 7. I'm sure these laborers must be very grateful to finally get hired after waiting for almost the whole day. They almost went home hungry. Then Jesus said, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Verses 8 and 9. It seems Jesus wants to make a point by having the manager pay the laborers in reversed order. Those who came last got paid first. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. Verse 10. This verse is addressed directly to Peter's question. Look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? The answer is that you will receive precisely according to God's grace, nothing more and nothing less. In fact, God's grace is more than abundant. But if you compare yourself with others, you would think you deserve more because you have served more. And it says, when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Verses 11 to 12. I'm sure those are originally a group of grateful people for getting hired early and securing their income for the day. But the moment they saw the latecomers treated equally, they forget their privilege and shift their focus to entitlement. But the kingdom doesn't function that way. The landlord said, 
Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Verse 15. The word envious is translated from the Greek idiom, literally evil eye, meaning jealousy, stinginess, envy, and greed. So we can translate it as, have your eyes turned evil because I'm generous to them. This verse reveals that they lost their initial peace and joy the moment their eyes turned evil. Evil in Hebrew tradition means being on the other side. Their gratitude turned into grudges. Even the generous boss becomes their enemy. They lost the key to the kingdom. If you want to maintain inner peace and joy, hold on to grace. Since grace is the key to the kingdom, use that to open every door when you feel locked out. For the closing, I want to give you three steps to use grace as the key to open the doors of heaven on earth so that you can maintain inner peace and joy. First, remember God's grace. Right after this parable, Jesus talked about his death and resurrection for the third time. He wants you to remember the grace you received through his death and resurrection. Knowing your sins are forgiven, the past and future, you will find inner peace and joy through a state of gratitude. The Bible says, from Jesus, we receive grace upon grace. So first, remember what he has done for you. Secondly, see everything through grace. When you see someone enjoying their life and success on social media or elsewhere, Don't let your eye turn evil. Instead, praise God for God's generosity to them. Celebrate with them. Don't forget that the grace you receive from the Lord is more than sufficient. Don't judge God's generosity to others as unfair, unjust, and unsavory. Don't be a sore loser. God loves you no less. So see everything through grace. Thirdly, treat everyone with grace. When you remember God's grace and see things through grace, you will be able to treat everyone with grace. Again, we live in a fallen world and must deal with fallen people. When you're stuck not knowing how to handle a fallen human, take out your key to the kingdom, grace, and you will discover the best solution. Again, it's simple but not necessarily easy. Grace is free, but not cheap. Just remember the greater grace you have received from Jesus Christ to his death and resurrection. Let's experience heaven on earth through grace. That's it for today. I hope you find this message illuminating as much as I enjoy receiving it from the head office. Until we meet again, keep your light shining brighter and broader and harvest the fruit of profound freedom, purpose, and happiness. Amen. Bye now.